All right. Well, looks like it'll probably be a short day. There's only three people on here, including myself. So uh, what I was thinking of doing today was simply answering questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Can we go over a black shoals problem? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let me create one actually. Okay. That way you have a little bit of an extra. Well, you have one extra question or two or so. Okay. On that. Let me also share my screen. <laughs> All right, so what I'm foreseeing with the Black Shoals problems is uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to use the formula uh, in the in the actual exam. Uh, so just for reference, this is the entire formula you'd have to use. Uh, not only would you have to input the five variables, stock price, strike price, uh, interest rate, implied volatility, and time to maturity. Uh, you would also have to use these, you see these N of D1 and, uh, where is it? Oh, N of D2. Uh, those are the normal distributions uh, based on whatever D1 or D2 is. So it's like the percentile of the normal distribution. Uh, since you won't have access to uh, the normal distribution tables or be able to calculate the Z statistic, because you won't have access to that kind of data, I'm not going to ask you to use this specific formula on the exam. Uh, however, what I would likely or be far more likely to ask you would be something related to uh, what happens or what effects do these five factors have on the price of a call or the price of a put option. Uh, so for example, something I'm might ask might be something like uh, Okay, so this would be something similar to what you might see on the exam. So you've just found out the price of a stock has increased and you have put options on that stock. What effect will the increase in the price of, uh, price of the stock have on the price of the put option? Well, this requires us to think about how a, a put option is priced. So the profit of a put option is K or the strike price minus the stock price minus the premium. And the premium is just the price you pay to purchase the option originally. That's the essentially the upfront cost of the option. So in this example, an increase in the price of the stock means that you're more out of the money. Uh, so let's say the price of the stock is $50 and our strike price is 30 and then the stock price jumps up to $60 per share. Well, you were already out of the money if you had this put option because the only way you profit is if the price of the stock is below 
$30. Well, if it moves above 50 to $60, now you've got a, I mean, you're, you're far more out of the money, which means the value of this, this put option will decrease e even further. I mean, you would never want to exercise this option, even if the price was only $50 as opposed to $60. So uh, what I foresee with Black Shoals is more, can you tell me which of, or how each of the five factors uh, that determine the price of a call and a put option have on uh, said call or corresponding put option. So, I, realistically, I'm probably not going to ask you uh, what relationship the uh, changes in the interest rate have, just because that one is not so intuitive. But if the pro, you know, more likely, I'll ask you about the other four or one of the other four. So, stock price increases or decreases, strike price increases or decreases, uh, implied volatility increases or decreases, uh, and then uh, time, uh, so longer time or shorter time. How would you do it with the volatility increasing or decreasing and then the time period changing? Oh yeah, so good question. So let's say we have this, this problem right now. Uh, and we'll change it so that the okay, so. In this case, in, uh, the only thing that happens is the implied volatility is increased. Well, the implied volatility means that the underlying stock is expected to be far more uh, or have a far more variable price, which means that there's, yeah, it, it probably won't increase the percentage of time that you're in the money, but if you're in the money, you're more, like to be, more likely to be way in the money. Uh, so the effect of an increase in implied volatility is that it will always increase the value of the put option, and it will always increase the value of a call option. The reason for this is because when the underlying asset gets more volatile, yeah, it's, it's not increasing the probability that you're in the money, but it is increasing how much you are in the money uh, when you are in the money. So uh, basically, implied volatility has a positive relationship with the price of a call and the price of a put. And, you know, the, the profit on a uh, call and profit on a put. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, there is, there's actually a specific slide in our uh, lecture slides that's devoted entirely to these relationships. Uh, I, I would strongly recommend studying that uh, intently. Uh, really, those, those first four relationships, for calls and puts, just the stock price, strike price, implied volatility, and time to maturity. Uh, know how those four uh, affect the value of the call or the value of the put. Won't ask you about the risk-free rate. Uh, let's see. What else uh, do you guys have questions about? Can you go over all the different types of calls and like the long straddle, short straddle stuff? Yeah, sure. Uh, so chances are, as I begin this, uh, you're probably not going to be, I guarantee you, I'm not going to ask you about uh, too many crazy option trading strategies. Uh, but the ones you should know, uh, let's see, what hmm, ones would I be most likely to ask about? Uh, 
I think the one that I'd be most likely to ask you about uh, would be the covered call. And actually for this one, let me pull up my paint program. And so with the covered call, what you're doing is you are, you're, you, you're buying a stock and you're selling a call, a call option. Uh, so let's think of a couple of cases. When you buy a stock, your profit on that stock or the value of that stock obviously goes up like this. Uh, this is the stock price and this we'll say is your profit. So stock price goes up, uh, it's more valuable to you. Now, when you sell a call, sorry about my uh, garbage skills. <laughs> uh, so when you sell a call, it's, what it looks like is this. And we'll say this is zero. So you've sold a call to someone else. As long as the stock price is below the strike price, you get the value of the premium, which is essentially this. Uh, so if this is like $2 per option contract that you sold, uh, this is your profit. But if the price of the stock rises above K, the strike price, now you're on the hook because whoever you sold that call option to is going to exercise that call option because it's in the money. So the more in the money that call option is, the more you're going to owe. So this is your, your profit structure when you've sold that call option. Now taken together, what you're gonna have is something like this. So if this is your uh, original stock price, then let me change colors to say red. Uh, this would be your, see, not two. Uh, that's, that is some fine drawing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, this represents your, uh, your actual strategy. So So the black line here is when you just buy the stock. The red line is when you execute a covered call. It's your profit structure. So the benefit here is that as long as the stock price, the underlying stock price is below the strike price, you get more profit. I mean, you, you profit because you got the premium by selling the call option. But the problem is if the price rises above the strike price, well, now you're paying out uh, this area right here. You're, you're having to pay out because someone's going to exercise that call option and that's gonna lead to a loss for you on your option, but you're still getting the profit from the stock. So what ends up happening is uh, this balances out. You get a flat line here in terms of profit. Uh, the, the stock and the option cancel each other out. Yeah, so that is the covered call. That's, I mean, of all the option trading strategies uh, that I might throw at you, that would be the by far the most likely. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think that that would be the only one I would probably ask you to focus on for the exam. I was thinking about maybe the straddle or the bull call spread, but quite frankly, I think you've probably got enough to worry about. Uh, what other questions do we have? <laughs> Any takers? Uh, so, it, while you're thinking of questions, uh, <laughs> I, I did have a conversation with a student and I did get a chance to ask them, so I haven't written the exam yet. Uh, I'm probably going to write it this afternoon. Uh, and I was trying to determine how many questions to put on the exam. So, like I said, it's going to be uh, very similar to exam two but I was debating between 25 and 35. And uh, based on that conversation with that student, I'll probably keep it on the lower end and still give you guys two hours to complete the exam. So I'm thinking probably probably 20 questions, as, or sorry, 25 questions as opposed to say 35. Uh, make sure you guys have plenty of time for the exam. We need to know a lot of the line item stuff. Uh, do that. So I won't be asking you to uh, do any complicated uh, calculations with the line items, but I mean, you should know the basics of accounting. So assets equals liabilities plus uh, equ uh, equity. Uh, you should know kind of how the, the income statement is laid out. Uh, the reason being, you know, if I ask you a question on, uh, hey, this this uh, free cash flow strategy involves you uh, identifying revenue in a given period or estimating revenue in a given period and then calcul calculating, uh, oh, let's say net operating, uh, we'll say uh, cost of goods sold and then uh, operating profit and then using that to determine uh, net income. And you're basing your entire assumptions on the percentage change in revenue. Uh, what, what method of forecasting would this be? Well, it'd be the percentage of sales strategy. So I, I won't be asking you to go from line item to line item specifically, but you should know kind of the, the basics. Uh, So uh, as I look down the formulas, you might want to put in that this is your net asset value or make a note that this is your net asset value. Value is total assets minus total liabilities divided by number of shares outstanding. Uh, you never know. It could uh, come in handy on the exam. So, uh, well. Hint, hint. All right. Reasonably ask you. Uh, uh, when you're studying, focus on the stuff that I spent the most time on in the in the class. I mean, I'm my goal is to not ask you any curveballs, especially with this earlier material. I mean, I'm literally just going to be asking you the big picture questions. So, you know, if I give you the uh, the order, uh, the outstanding orders for a stock, like the outstanding bids and the outstanding asks. What is the bid ask spread? Well, it's just the difference between the highest bid and the lowest asking price. 
what does it imply? Well, it's our primary measure of market liquidity, or you know, if you want to think about it the other way, primary measure of market illiquidity. The higher the spread, the more illiquid the market for that asset. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I, I can say with certainty, I'm going to ask you to calculate returns or holding period returns. I mean, that's, that's a given. Uh, Cap M, I mean, I think I mentioned about a dozen times that Cap M is one of the five most important formulas in all of finance. So yeah, definitely expect a Cap M question. Uh, remember that dividends are signals. Uh, they are, I mean, one of the most important signals in all of finance, short of, oh, I don't know, the CEO resigning. It's probably more important when a dividend is cut than when a CEO resigns. Let's see. PE ratios and other valuation ratios like them, like the price to operating cash flow per share or price to sales per share. All of these are measures of growth prospects of the firm. The higher the valuation ratio, like the PE ratio, the more or the, the more rapidly that investors believe whatever is in the denominator here is going to grow. So if the trailing PE ratio or historical PE ratio, it's really high. Basically, investors are paying a high price for dollars of earnings per share uh, over the past year because they expect earnings per share to grow at a rapid rate in the future. Uh, yeah. Shoot, I'm trying to think of other things that might be of use here. Uh, since we did talk about the these formulas up here, you can be pretty darn sure I'm going to ask you at least, uh, well, one of the you know, to value a stock using the the Gordon or dividend discount model. Uh, I'll probably also ask you to uh, value a stock using market multiples. Uh, basically, any calculation questions that you see here you can be pretty confident that you're going to see a question like this just because we, uh, I guess I've told you how I, how I uh, write my exams. I mean, basically I just go down the list. Oh, I haven't asked a question about this. Okay, let me write a question about this. Okay. Uh, yeah, when in doubt, stick to this roadmap. And any questions that require you to use formulas that are not on the sheet, Commit those formulas to memory. I mean, you should have the cap M and the return formulas committed to memory uh, at this point. But I'm trying to think of, I mean, bid ask spread is just the difference between bid and ask, or ask and bid, I guess I should say. Uh, yeah. Other than that. What's the other word for the Gordon growth model? Uh, dividend discount model. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, the name for the model depends entirely on the textbook publisher you have. I mean, the most appropriate name is probably the Gordon growth model just because it's named after the guy that developed it. But I mean, I've used three textbooks in investments throughout the years at various institutions. Some will call it the dividend discount model. Some it'll be the Gordon growth model, and then in some is it'll it'll just be the uh, uh, the uh, the simple linear growth uh, discount model or the the free cash flows uh, discount model. I mean it's it, it's got like half a dozen names, but yeah, Gordon growth model equals dividend discount model. On the exam, I'll probably call it the dividend discount model just to keep it as consistent as I possibly can. Is the perpetuity formula on the reference sheet? Oh, good question. Uh, no, that that is one uh, you will absolutely want to commit to memory. And it is just price equals dividend divided by uh, discount rate. So basically, if so, the I mean, the, 
really the only example I can give you off the top of my head where we ever use this formula in practice is with that preferred stock where it's just it pays out a set dividend each period. So we put our dividend here, divide by, uh, usually it's just going to be the, the interest rate or the yield on that preferred stock, and then out comes the price. Uh, commit this one to memory. It will come in handy. Okay. Well, feel free to fire off any other questions. Should we focus more on studying the, like the exam reviews and the past final exams or just studying the topics? Uh, so start with the topics uh, because I, I will say that we did have a, the start of this semester, we did change up what is taught in the intro to investments and financial markets. So if you go to the, the past exams, you'll see that I covered bonds in uh, the past exams. This semester, I didn't cover bonds because they're being covered in financial markets going forward. Uh, and I also spent more time on futures. So basically, this roadmap that you see, I mean, this is the first thing uh, you should study. You should study. Make sure you know something about each of these bullet points and then test yourself uh, using first the review because the review is specifically designed to give you the best approximation of what our exam is going to be. And then for extra practice, go to the, the past exam. So uh, my recommendation, you know, just go bullet point by bullet point as you're studying and see if you can you know, write a short blurb or you know, rattle off something about each of these. So for example, what is the goal of stock valuation? Well, determine whether a stock is undervalued or overvalued. That would be what you would really need to know for this one. And if it comes up on an exam question, well, I'll probably be asking you, you know, if the intrinsic value is above the market price, what does that mean? That falls more in line with this bullet point. Almost thought of uh, having this thing outside today. A little chilly. Okay. Well, uh, are there any other questions? One more big sip of coffee. Okay. Well, uh, why don't we do this? If you guys do have any other questions, I mean, at all, uh, I'll be around. I did schedule to, uh, I did leave my schedule open from eight to 11. So I'll be happy to, you know, work a Zoom meeting or uh, answer any questions as soon as I get them. Uh, but yeah, I guess I'm, I'm kind of out of review material unless someone else has something. Uh, also, if you do have questions in the run up to the exam, so the exam window will be open from uh, basically midnight on Monday until 11:59 uh, at uh, on Friday night. Uh, so you'll have a full five days to work it. Uh, if you do have any questions right up until the start of the exam, please email me. Please call me. I mean, my number is I think on the syllabus. That's my actual cell phone number. So you know, feel free to make use of it. Uh, yeah, beyond that, I, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm out of uh, things to say about the exam. Okay. 
Well, uh, with that, I guess we'll we'll call it and you know, good luck studying and uh, fire off any questions that you have. But it's it's been a good semester. It's been an odd semester, but you know, a lot of good questions this semester. All right. Well, take care, guys, and I guess I'll I, I might not see you, but you know, hopefully come fall I'll probably see you in the hallways. <laughs>